unfortunately we we had a slight mishap with the with the technology so she will she'll be presenting without a, um, a presentation but hopefully we'll we'll get get there yes so, yes, yes thank you very yes, much indeed um right okay really sorry about this um however um it's the, the title of the piece is spare us the detail and that's a bit of a nod towards older post-excavation assessments that used to um, really try and present everything in the post-excavation assessment report that would be the get-out-of-jail ticket for whatever came next in an archive report. It would be seen to be a stage at which a job had been done, and that was largely to get the stratigraphic detail all bound up into one massive um, volume, which was practically unreadable. Really happily, we've moved on from post-excavation those, since those days. And I just wanted to sort of go back a little bit to um, show you uh, how, how we've got to where we've got to. I don't know whether you can see that. <laughs> can you see that? <laughs> no. Oh, no. Oh, it didn't like that. Oh, shutting down. Oh, flipping, flopping, flip flops. Okay, that's rubbish, isn't it? Right, well, I'll bring that back into being um, while we talk. Totally random talk. I'm really sorry about this. Um, it's dead. <laughs> uh, so, really, changes in the planning process since 1990 have tightened investigation procedures, um, including post-excavation stage of work. PPS 5, uh, published in 2010, um, and NPPF, the National Planning Policy Framework, in 2012, streamlined all areas managed by the planning process in relation to development and land use planning. The hard to interpret and easy to misinterpret um, planning uh, condition developed for PPG 16 in 1990 was remodelled by Historic England working with CIFA, Algeo and the planning inspectorate at that time and they produced a revised model condition that spells out the assessment and analysis stages, as well as those relating to publication, dissemination, and all, the all-important archive. I just have to um, break into this, sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, for work, right, that will warm up. Um, uptake of this condition is not consistent in the planning uh, in planning authorities in England. I'm going to have to read it out to you. It's quite an important set of wording in it. Um, and here it is <laughs> on slide form. And, uh, and it says, no de demolition or development shall take place or commence until a written scheme of investigation has been submitted to and approved by the local planning authority in writing. For land that is included in the WSI, blah, 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 um, usual stuff, and then it des describes that it must have a research objective and a statement of significance. It also says the programme and methodology of site investigation and recording and the nomination of a competent person or organisation to undertake the works must be identified and the programme for post-investigation assessment and subsequent analysis, publication and dissemination and deposition of resulting material must also be set out and ended to say this part of the condition shall not be discharged until these elements have been fulfilled in accordance with the program set out in the WSI. That is in paragraph 37 of Historic England's good practice advice note number two that um, came forward to support PPS 5 but more recently the NPPF um, planning conditions. It's absolutely critical because it was a big turnaround for us in on our side of the archaeological table because it meant that here within the planning condition the assessment process and the post-excavation process archiving everything to do with that was actually listed so that's that was an important change it might have seemed minor for a lot of people but it was an incredibly important driver of how we um, undertake business on a day-to-day -day basis PINs, however, don't um, always use it, the planning inspectorate, so should a scheme go through to, this is probably too much planning information, but should a, a scheme go forward to um, some kind of rejection phase by the planning committee or the planning authority, um, that this will be put forward on appeal through to the planning inspectorate, 
who will often sort of revise the review of the planning committee by agreement, by negotiation, and by the production of new information, whether that's on archaeological grounds or anything else. And, um, um, and But they'll usually default to the old um, PPG 16 condition that still has a currency. Um, that's really unfortunate that they do that, and it sets back all the good work that came through with the new condition um, uh, at uh, the time of writing in around 2012. Um, so, um, so there's always work to do. The, the, the bottom line of that is that there's always something to be done for all of us. You know, we have enshrined, therefore, in planning condition, if the right one is used, that there will be a post-excavation assessment phase, analysis, dissemination, publication, archiving. Um, but, um, but we are all duty-bound at all levels to remind our clients or any kind of funder of that process. Um, so that's, a, that's just a permanent educational thing. And we explain the process day in, day out to every developer who finds a new um, um, problem that they have to face um, and, uh, and deal with. So uh, back in <laughs> and down we go. So oh, I've told you about the condition. So then... Yeah. The subtitle, however, of today's session is What Should Form an Ideal Post-Excavation Assessment? And this is something that Duncan has gone, uh, alluded to at the back. <laughs> and, uh, and he um, quoted the MORPH um, guidance to you, showing how that, that assessment stage should um, actually continue from here. So within MORPH, uh, even though that particular guidance itself might be a little bit odd compared to the um, MAP and MAP2 principles, uh, they're supported by uh, project planning notes. And PPN3 is the one that support. Oh, don't do it again. Sorry, I'm pressing that button again. <laughs> it supports um, uh, the MORPH guidance. And so 2.1.4 of that PPN3 says. Project proposals for fieldwork projects must include plans for all work up to and including site archive completion and assessment. The assessment estimates may need to be revised in light of the emerging results of fieldwork. And that, crucially to us, is the cost break period of that programme. So it's a point at which um, contractors should be allowed and their specialists to be able to revise the quotes that they had already put forward because now post-excavation, the, uh, the, the, the sum of all of the um, acquisitions from the site is, is actually being quantified and audited and assessed and, re and a refinement in the cost uh, budget profile is, is being able to be uh, delivered. Um, luckily, Duncan showed you a slide that you could read which set out from the Algeo um, guidelines um, which are the drivers now for us um, in terms of how we look as curators at the post-excavation assessment stage. Um, and and it, it sort of goes on in that document to say that um, a PXA quantifies recovered data and evidence from all stages of work at a site, describing range, character and date, indicates those areas of recovered data, provides statement of potential, identifies appropriate analytical techniques, um, to be used in further analysis. That's a pretty crucial one. Um, provides a statement of the combined potential of all areas of analysis and indicates the significance of the research as assessed against the appropriate regional research agenda. So going back to Duncan's problem, who are we writing this for? It really is for everybody. We all take different aspects out of that document to sort of work out whether the money is going to be spent well, whether the research objectives are well prioritised, uh, and defined uh, whether the resourcing um, is, is adequate for those sorts of tasks as well. Are the right people employed to undertake this? Have your specialists um, given you the, the funding um, profile that is needed to be able to un un identify exactly how that work is going to continue? Um, and then it also has to provide a retention strategy, a discard strategy. We also have to start looking at the archive at that point. How big is the archive? 
Um, what are its conservation needs? Have they been fully addressed in that post-excavation assessment stage as well? Usually, conservation is an also-ran. It shouldn't be, but it usually very typically is. And it's the last thing that everybody panics about when they're trying to put things into boxes and they, have, they realise that they need quite a bit more money spent on that side of the business. Um, and so it also will set out how the archive report will be prepared, delivered and stored, and how the results will be disseminated. And for us, um, what we want, I have a little box here, save funds, provide a succinct account of the site's findings. That's the, that's the base, best thing, because this isn't the archive report, and we don't want reams and reams and reams of detail. But the most important thing, really, is the assessment of potential from each of the artefacts, environmental samples, science stages, and all of the sort of stratigraphic information um, that has been digested to some part to be able to create the phasing of the site in its very initial form, because that should change. If it doesn't change, it means the assessment stage has been ignored, or that analysis is not actually needed. So... Uh, what else can I tell you? A curator, when reading a post-excavation assessment, has a view to confirming that the proposed analysis is adequately resourced in, in terms of time and appropriate personnel because we don't see any budget. We can't. That's a commercial enterprise between a client and their agents and contractors. That's not in our gift to do that. But we can read between the lines and see if relevant personnel have been secured and we want to be able to see in that Gantt chart that supports post-excavation assessments whether there is actually a really useful time frame shown in which that specialist identified for a specific task will actually be able to deliver that. And you have to remember that we see lots of post-excavation assessments at the same time within a given county. So we might know that the same specialists are being used and that it's an impossibility that they'll be able to stick to that Gantt chart requirement. It's just not possible. So when we might come across as being really shirty about <laughs> we don't believe you, it's for those reasons. It is an unrealistic prospect. And so I had another slide, do's and don'ts of project management, which you can't see. Uh, find out if your usual specialists can work on a new project at the tendering stage. Ask them at that stage, because they might be able to say, got nothing for a year, in which case you have to find another one working with your typical specialist to be able to say who they would recommend for you to approach because they know the subject matter or they know the area in, from which it's coming. It's really, really important to do that. Ask the specialists for their own costs. Don't try and make them up. Do not try and make them up. You will always fail because you don't necessarily... I don't know who I'm talking to here. <laughs> One doesn't necessarily know what all the published methodologies are per discipline and what it is a particular specialist has to do to achieve those and to stay within their given procedural documents and, uh, and uh, standards. So, you know, it might be for some of the sciences that you're not including things like bench fees and uh, chemical acquisitions and things like that. You're just, or one is just, booking time. And that cannot be the case anymore. We really have got to start having a much better dialogue with specialists and with the funding bodies. So the post-excavation assessment, if it has to say this won't be delivered for two years beyond the two-year programme, that's okay. So long as you can get an agreement to do that with the plan with the um, client and so long as the planning authority will accept it. They won't always, doesn't always happen. They say, no, you must get these things off the books. Um, but we have, in Cambridgeshire alone, um, big backlogs of uh, undischarged uh, planning conditions. It is a problem. It's endemic across the country. But, you know, but there is a way of keeping dialogue with planning committees to and planning authorities to make them understand uh, you know, the, the, how the management of the project works. So, you know, I'm sure that Simon will have a solution to that, but <laughs> let's find <laughs> out. <laughs> so, uh, advise your client that an archaeological budget given at the tendering stage will be refined in line with published guidance. I hadn't intended to read these out. I, hope, I hoped you could read them out. Um, 
following the assessment, uh, it, it may stay the same or additional costs might be needed to undertake the relevant analysis. So this then uh, leads us on to, will you actually be, be uh, meeting the objective of preservation by record? That an excavation happened means that there must have been a period at which somebody took a decision to say we're going to preserve the site by record because we're not preserving it in situ. If you don't create the record by completing the post ex and producing on the archive report and the publication text, you haven't you haven't preserved the site by record. It doesn't exist as a site, you know, and it doesn't get entered to the HER. It's it's in limbo land. It's a really big problem. Um, properly worked out fixed costs like staff costs and rents. Curators, we're not allowed to talk about these sorts of things, but we can see sometimes that there's a problem of understanding between fixed costs and variable costs versus fixed price contracts. And fixed price contracts do enable some degree of change because fixed costs are known for to be absolutely time limited. And, uh, and if the change you know, in the structure of how those costs are work out changes within that period, then they have to absorb and allow for that sort of change to occur and be able to change, therefore, the um, budget as previously set two years earlier. Anything can happen in two years that will change those sorts of things. We'll have a pension crisis and people's salaries costs go up. But it shouldn't be down to the contractor to absorb all of those penalty issues as they see them. You know, there has to be a dialogue going backwards and forwards with the, cl with the client in order to um, enable that kind of um, fee problem to be resolved. Some typical problems was another slide um, showing two boxes of, um, you know, problem and what that led to. So it's very simple. It's only a few points. Um, so analytical techniques presented in the winning project design, you know, ultimately can't be carried out on cost grounds. So what does that lead to? It represents a departure from the agreement, from the written scheme of investigation. Um, and it can lead to a revised timetable for delivery. But as I said, that's not always possible. But by negotiation and by telling your curator what the problem is and getting your curator to or consultant to work for you to enable that uh, time change to occur and uh, through a formal departure notice, things can be achieved. Insufficient absolute dating to support phase groups and refined ceramic assemblages, spot dating, um, is a key aspect of all regional frameworks as far as I can see. And yet we don't spend any money trying to refine those ceramic chronologies or whatever it is that we're trying to achieve. Um, but not having, especially for large sites where you do have uh, a very significant assessment stage and you really are refining and uh, rescoping the research objectives, if you haven't got dating to support it, it can't be supported by your curator or by your assisting you know, uh, consultant and, and uh, person who is the interface between the funder and the deliverer. So that, that, that actually matters. You know, if we're not fulfilling regional research frameworks, why are we doing this? It shouldn't be happening. Publication, therefore, enters the doldrums, never gets resolved. You know, backlogs are just too many across the country. And so that, that comes back to the preservation in situ not, uh, by record not being achieved. Often that will lead to a lack of funding to deposit the archive. So it's not then publicly accessible for anybody else to use it. So again, publication, uh, preservation by record hasn't been achieved. Nobody will know that it exists except by contact with the actual excavating um, authority. HERs won't accept uncompleted um, archive, just won't do it. Digital archiving is not undertaken, and that's a bit more of a difficult issue that we're, I think, facing a bigger problem, a bigger crisis from uh, for again, across the country anyway. Um, but uh, but it, again, access to survey and metric data, any digital-born data, isn't isn't there and able to be uh, achieved. So that's a shame. Last slide. There's a lovely mosaic of a <laughs> Roman money bag from Pompeii with all its money spilled out and, uh, and, uh, and a bunch of archive boxes going into a skip. 
uh, which was just a metaphor to show that it really isn't, if you cannot deliver the post-excavation assessment, you haven't preserved the site by record, it doesn't exist uh, because you're not publishing it either. It's a big dramatic problem that we're facing. Assessment is key. It has to be succinct, really streamlined, and uh, are very focused in order to make very bold decisions about not doing certain things because they're not going to change the picture from the assessment stage and putting streamlining money into very focused areas that really will have something to say about an area. And by taking very tough decisions, you might be able to find that you can wrap up a particular um, site much quicker, deposit something in the HDR, deposit the archive, do your conservation, spend and uh, publish a really nice, you know, single issue kind of uh, report rather than everything about everything that was ever found on that site. And there are better ways. <laughs> <than it. laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>